Joining us now, she's the head coach at Wichita State, fresh off a year where they won the American Conference regular season and American Conference tournament champions, got to the regional final. I speak of Christy Breadbender, back with us here at In the Circle, Coach. Uh, there's some new titles there we've added there since we last spoke. Yeah, it was a great year. You know, 2021 will be a, a historic and well-remembered year in Shocker softball. You went 41-13-1. and uh, got to a regional final, a memorable regional final against Oklahoma to the point where Coach Gasso was a big proponent of your team and felt that you got a bad raw deal because uh, you didn't want to deal with your offense anymore. Uh, when you had a chance to reflect on last season, what comes to mind? Oh, man, so many things. I think for us, um, just a, a really – special group uh, that transformed, I felt like, from fall to spring, really embraced each other as teammates and, and believed in each other and believed in the success uh, that our program was capable of. Um, obviously, you reflect, and the first thing you're probably going to think about is offense. I mean, we hit 103 home runs. Um, you know, Madison Perrigan and Addie Barnard hit 21 and 22 home runs. Um, so the bats were working. Um, but, you know, I think the biggest thing for me is just adversity. You know, you're coming off of, of you know, a pretty tough 2020. And uh, we weren't playing well, obviously, in 2020. And uh, COVID came and, and obviously threw us off for a loop. And the fall was a odd transition because everybody was testing. And we had several, I think we had over almost 70% of our players at some point had COVID. Um, and so I think, you know, when you're, you don't get to play any fall competition, you're, you're constantly scrimmaging yourself. Um, you know, you're, you're facing a lot of things that you've never gone through and isolation. And, you know, there was just all kinds of things. And to me, when we walked away from the fall season, I was worried. I didn't think we had great team chemistry. Um, I knew we had a lot of talent. We had really great leadership as far as the um, experiences that they had had coming back. Um, but we just, you know, we just weren't clicking on, on all cylinders. And I think we had such a big difference in ages. We had a really large freshman and sophomore group and a really large, actually, junior, senior, fifth-year senior group. And, you know, I think that the, the easiest way to put it is, is that when you were putting limitations with COVID on mass gatherings, we didn't have any mass gatherings when it came to the entire softball team. We had a lot of gatherings with our older kids, and we had a lot of gatherings with our younger kids in the fall. And so I really think it took our kids understanding that we needed to get to know each other a little bit better and and all be on the same page and, and working towards the same goals and um, I spoke last week in Chicago for the NFCA and I did a presentation on team chemistry and and what we've done in the past you know to kind of promote team chemistry and last year's team chemistry motto um, was actually watching Ted Lasso and as a program, we came back from, from Christmas break, and I had watched it twice, so I'd seen it when it came out and watched it again over break. And there were so many great um, lessons in life and in sport in that program in that first season especially. And I just kind of thought, you know what, this is fun. It's 30 minutes. Um, you know, not all of our girls have Apple TV, if any of them do. So very few of them probably had seen it. And so we started practice uh, that first week and we practiced in the morning, took a lunch break, and then the team would meet and we'd watch an episode of Ted Lasso. And we'd talk after that episode of, you know, what we learned, what are some of the takeaways, what are, what are some things that were important that we can implement into our program? And it started spraying a little bit of conversation, but it also got some excitement going. The girls always wanted to watch the next episode right away instead of being able to, to wait for the next day to watch it. And, but they did a good job. We ended up taking two weeks. We watched every episode. We talked about it after, um, you know, they were over. And, and we walked away with so many uh, thoughts in our head that I think it started to kind of allow our kids to see things differently, see their teammates differently, understand that level of respect that you have to have for the program, for each other, for your managers, your coaches, your teammates, all the people that work their rear ends off 
because we're all going towards that same goal. We want to win championships. We want to have a successful program, but we also want to have a great student athlete experience. And Ted Lasso kind of brought that out in a lot of our kids. I think um, our fifth year seniors started to see that, you know, they needed to be different types of leaders and, and stepped into a different role that I think our younger kids really needed. You know, we made it may have had a couple of our upperclassmen that did a much better job of maybe leading the older kids. And then we had an upperclassman who did a really great job of embracing the younger kids and getting to know them. And so that bridged, I think, that gap that we needed from a chemistry perspective. And when we started playing that first weekend, um, you know, we weren't without our limitations. I think we were missing a couple players because of COVID and we went two and two. We hit great the first day and then uh, ran into a great Texas softball team that we weren't ready for and then got snake bitten by Corpus Christi in a game we weren't really prepared for. And, and so we walked away two and two that weekend and our program could have gone one of two ways. I think we could have, you know, decided are we better than the team we play were on Sunday? Are we the team that we were playing on Saturday? And uh, we talked a lot about it at practice. And, you know, the, the evolution of the high chew happened on the way home that weekend. And, uh, you know, we, we chose the Saturday. The way we played on that Saturday was great. We were explosive. We were aggressive. We pitched well. We played great defense. And we really played for each other. And we really celebrated each other's successes instead of being so focused on our own. And I think that was where we really embodied a lot of those life lessons that we saw with Ted Lasso and what we needed to transition. And when you, when you look at that point um, in, the, in that next month, we hardly lost a game. I mean, we swept Creighton. We went to uh, UT Arlington and swept that weekend with a big game against Iowa State, who at the time was playing really well and, and beat them. And I think they were ranked in the top 25 and we just started creating that momentum. I think we played at home in a tournament. We went to Oklahoma State, beat them on that Thursday night game and, and really beat them. It wasn't like, oh, we slid by. We beat them. We scored 11 on them. And you could just kind of see the excitement, the adrenaline, um, and really just the passion and fun in this group. They were going to leave it all on the field. And when you have six seniors that knew that, you know, they weren't coming back that next year. You leaned into those kids, um, you know, to be the the experience, but also the fire on the field. And then we had some young kids that really stepped up. Sid McKinney had a fantastic year for us. Addie Barnard, freshman of the year. Um, just some really big moments. Um, I think the one thing that, and I'm rambling a little bit here, but the one thing that I'm most proud of that that really could have went south was our pitching staff. You know, our pitching coach decided not to come back uh, over Christmas break. Um, I caught in college and, and have had to do some of the pitch calling and things like that in the past, but it really stepped away from that in the recent years. And, um, you know, so Presley Bell, our graduate manager at the time who pitched at Houston, and I sat down and I said, all right, you know, you're going to kind of be the mechanics person. You know the mechanics well, and we're going to tackle bullpens together, especially early, and I'm going to call pitches and you know, so that insight and uh, that little bit extra work that I had to do for that um, was helpful. But I think for for the pitching staff, I was more present than I've ever been. And um, I think that helped them. And they had a great year. You know, you look at our numbers and they weren't the best numbers we've ever had, but they they definitely weren't the worst. But our ERA went up one point one points in postseason in that OU regional, if you take that regional out, our ERA was the best it's ever been in, you know, the time that I've been here in 11 years. And, and so I like to take the regional out of that when we talk about it, because at that point, you know, it, 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 you're not encompassing the body of work. I thought their regular season pitching performances were excellent. Caitlin Bingham, Aaron McDonald, Bailey Lang, the three of them pitched well and didn't get a not enough credit because our offensive performances always overshadowed um, everything that we were doing in the circle. But there was a lot of times when our pitching was really, really good. And so to me, that was that hidden thing that nobody talked about that I'm most proud of um, because I felt like I got to be a part of something um, that, you know, really, really made an impact on me as a coach and made me understand that, you know, when we're in season, I've got to be more involved in our staff and our pitchers and understand 
their ins and outs and ebbs and flows and things like that. And, and so to me, that's something that, that we really took away from the season. Yeah, your pitching was tremendous. I was a believer when I saw you in person against UCF and you shut down UCF's offense. Uh, which was one of the best there. And that was when I was well, like, wow, with Bailey Lang. And, and, but Kate, but you didn't, it wasn't just Bailey Lang. It was Caitlin Bingham. And, you know, you had a, a staff. And that was why you got a, a position to win a conference championship. And that's – take me through that last week of the regular season because you were off. Uh, you, were, you, didn't, you, you were supposed to play Arkansas. That got canceled. So now you're, you're at home. You have to follow the UCF South Florida series. You know UCF needs to at least split with South Florida for you to win the regular season title. If South Florida wins three out of four, they're the regular season champions. What was that weekend like for you and the staff and the team? You don't have a game, so you're basically just following this and hoping for UCF to help you win the league. Well, we had practice, so I I, I can't remember if I have the dates on this ride or the scores, but I think UCF won the opening game on Friday night. No, you South remember? Florida, they, they won the first game. Uh, South Florida did? They did. So then they played okay. a double header. Okay. So they South- played the double header yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. We had practice at the during the first double header. So the first game of the double header, we had practice. Our trainers got the game on her phone. And, you know, you could tell there was some distraction a little bit, but we got after it a little bit and got out there and, and at least we're staying active. I think for us, that weekend came at a perfect time. We needed a break. You know, our kids were exhausted and, um, you know, it'd been a long season, especially playing the four games in a weekend in conference. It just, we got to that point there where the bye weekend for us, I think had we played Arkansas, um, both of us probably benefited from being off that weekend and, and kind of getting everything ready to go before we headed to our tournament. So definitely some distracted practice, but when Central Florida won the first game, the jitters and the excitement definitely took a turn and it was like, okay, this could really happen. And uh, everybody went home from practice and, you know, I'm sure, you know, I know groups went certain places. Like some of the girls were hanging out at each other's houses and having lunch and watching game three. I was at home. I had it on our television. I had it on our TV downstairs and upstairs, um, you know, just kind of going back and forth, watching, watching. And then, I mean, it was, you know, pretty much a, a, a defeat. I mean, I'm pretty sure Central Florida scored early and just kind of kept putting it on them. You know, they had South Florida's number this past year. I felt like they weren't afraid of them at all. And, you know, for whatever reason, Cork's great against us, fantastic <laughs> against us, throws her best softball, even admitted it this summer that she threw her best she's ever thrown here this past year. And, and credit her because she's fantastic, but credit Central Florida because they weren't afraid and they competed. And, um, you know, when they won that second game, you know, the only thing that I can say is that everybody's phones started blowing up. Um, you know, we have a group me group with softball and everybody was going back and forth on that about how excited they were. And obviously a lot of congratulations and things like that were being shared, you know, via text message and, and whatnot. And so, um, you know, it just, we we had kind of made our own bed and knew we had to lie in it and it could go one way or the other and you could look back and think oh man that loss against East Carolina or you know the the fourth game against Tulsa that we felt like we should have won things like that were they going to come back and burn us was that tie going to hurt us you know all of those things we're like we can't do anything about them now so all we can hope for is uh you know uh, Coach Malone and, and and her scrappy, very talented team could, you know, give us the biggest break of our lives, and they did a good job of it and ended up winning. I, they've won game three or game four as well, so it ended up being a 3-1 yep. series win for them, which was huge. And, you know, I think the biggest thing for us is understanding that that was an opportunity that, that you know, we can all share together as a team because we got to sit down and watch it and celebrate uh, in our groups and, and with our families and, and whatever is going to make us, um, you know, happy. And, and it was we were fortunate to do that. Had to be special, too, for the group that was a part of the 18 team. You were so close. It came down to a winner-take-all last game of the regular season in 18 in Tampa against South Florida and Corrick, and they beat you. And I remember that we were the conference tournament. It was in Tampa. That was a tough pill to swallow. I think you guys still had a bit of a hangover even in the conference tournament. You played a red hot Tulsa. You got hot there in that tournament. But 
you know, you mentioned that UCF series. That was South Florida had taken the first game with Cork. They had the lead going into the seventh. UCF comes from behind. They they tie the game on a wild pitch or yep. a pass ball, and then they win it on a squeeze play. Yeah, you're right. I <laughs> forgot about that. The Jada Cody squeeze play, which, you know, I'm in the booth and I'm trying to like, did she just call a squeeze? And they just carry that two outs or something, right? Yeah, two outs, squeeze, and they score the winning run from third to even that series, and that kind of carried that momentum to the second game because Corey couldn't pitch the second game; she wasn't available for that second game unless they had the lead, probably. But it was the second game of that doubleheader, and UCF kind of broke it open and run ruled them, and that's when uh, you got to lock up the title. It was a wild, and exciting weekend, but it really, in a, in a year, it was a success for the league. I mean. Those were the three best teams in the league was you, UCF and South Florida. That would show in the regionals as all three of you got to the regional final. You would see UCF again in the championship game, which was a back and forth seesaw. What was that game like for you to then double up and win the tournament title? That game was uh, one of the one of my most favorite games I've ever coached in. In fact, we've been watching some highlights lately of last season that are on YouTube that we were looking forward to do some different video stuff. And the conference did a nice job of putting together a highlight reel of that uh, particular game. And, you know, you just think about the emotions. Uh, you know, our girls still talk about it. You know, and we we were down almost, I mean, till at least the fifth inning. And they talk about how they never thought we were going to lose. They knew we were going to continue to win that game, even though we were down. I mean, they jumped out early. They scored in the first inning and then, um, you know, uh, hit hit a freaking monster bomb, two of them. Um, I'm blanking on their first baseman's name. Dory, um, uh, Jasmine Esparza was the one. Esparza, I mean, yes. she was red hot that day. And, uh, I mean, she hit one that hit the light pole. Had it not hit the, the light <laughs> pole, it might have landed on the football field at the 50-yard line. I mean, it was crushed. And, you know, you just kept getting those same type of kids up to bat. And it was like, gosh, didn't we just have this kid up? And and they were fighting hard. And, you know, I think for us, Madison Perrigan, Riley Buck, Addie Barnard, I mean, we used the long ball. We used what we had been using all season to get back in that game. And Addie Barnard torched one down the left field line that it hit off of the, I think they had like a ladder or some kind of crane out there that they were doing some stuff on video wise. And um, you know, Madison Perrigan's home run, I think that put us ahead was probably one of the bigger home runs of the season for our program. And, and then Riley did a great job of putting one out of the ballpark there and it just got over. I don't think anybody thought it was going to go out, but, you know, you look at that game, um, you know, even the Tulsa game, all that momentum carried into the postseason. And the one thing that I always look back and cherish is that, you know, those girls, Madison Perrigan, Riley Buck, Kaylee Hecker, Bailey Lang, Bailey Nickerson, they were everyday kids in our program for four years, five years, and they had some of their best weekends. Madison Perrigan hit nine home runs out of her last like 14 at bats, which is just nuts, and uh, became somebody who was so clutch for us. Riley had two home runs against OU in the regional. Kaylee's defense finally was recognized for, for years. I thought she was the best defensive player I've ever seen. And, you know, Bailey left it all out in the field and had some really great innings pitched. And B-Nick, just to see her have success and, and control our outfield for us and really grow as an athlete, it just was fun. It was so enjoyable to see those girls compete. There was not as much coaching at that point. It was just, hey, you guys are prepared. Do what you do. Don't give up. Believe in yourselves and go out there and have fun competing. And they did a really good job of that. Selection night, you get placed to go to Norman. A lot of people were shocked, including Patty Gasso. Uh, she was very vocal throughout that whole week how you should not have been there. What? Take me through that. You go to selection night. You know you're going somewhere. Were you shocked that you were going to Norman? And then you would play two memorable games with them. You beat A&M twice. That was a memorable region. And then you played Oklahoma. That was nationally televised. You had the lead on them in that winner's bracket game. You know, pushed them to the limit. It was a tight game. And, you know, you mentioned the offenses in that regional was just on a, a, a different level. Of course, they have a historic offense. You have a historic offense. So, of course, there's going to be a lot of offense. But what was that whole week like starting with Selection Sunday night? 
Well, I think Selection Sunday goes without being said, we were disappointed. I mean, we it, were in the same boat. We didn't agree where we were being sent. You know, to see some of the schools that were getting sent that were within driving distance to us as a two seed, knowing we were better than them as a two seed, but we're going to the number one seed, really made no sense. Um, but you know what? One of the things we learned, I think, in COVID, in that first year, is that there's so many things we can't control. And, and so right away, our motto was, you know what, we're going here. All we can do is do our best and try to wreak as much havoc and make it as hard on these teams to get out of this regional as possible, believe in ourselves and, and, and fight. And, you know, you're always excited to go to postseason. I think our kids were disheartened because I truly, and I think they truly believed we had a super team, a, a super regional team. Yeah. I think there are several other regionals that we could have won as the two seed. We always knew we were probably going to be a two seed, but there were several other regionals we could have won. One, you know, I mean, one being at Stillwater. I mean, I love Kenny, love Oklahoma State. We beat them two out of three times. And I know for a fact, Kenny came up to us over the summer and was like, oh my God. I totally thought you were going to get sent to our regional and we were nervous and I get it. I love it. I love hearing that. I think it's an awesome compliment to our program. We agree. I mean, we felt like that was a, a, a maybe a regional we had a shot at, at winning and in several others, you know, that were in driving distance that I think we could have competed. It just was for us tough to go to the number one seed, knowing that our body of work and w the wins and, and things that we had throughout the season, but the offense you're going to send the top two teams at the time in home runs to the same regional. And, you know, that was a, a tough pill to swallow, but we embraced it. Um, our kids worked hard. You know, we didn't even actually talk a lot about Oklahoma because we knew we had a really tough opponent in Texas A&M. And, uh, you know, we, we basically went to practice on that Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We tried to simulate as much as we possibly could of a &M's pitching because we hadn't played a and since 2016 had I hadn't seen their pitchers live you know at, since then and obviously that was when Samantha Shaw was there so you know we didn't know much about them but you know we got as much scouting information video things like that as we could and we prepped for it and day one was tough our kids were like oh this is unrealistic you know, nobody's going to pitch like this and blah, 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 blah. But we kept doing it. And by day three, they were starting to really have success over on our game plan and, and, and the things that we were putting them through to prepare. And uh, you could kind of see, OK, we can do this. This is going to be a challenge, but we can do this. And, you know, that first game was a dogfight. I mean, we score, they score, we score, they score, we score, and we just scored enough because I think there, that game was nine to six or nine to seven. I can't remember. And I remember after the game was over um, doing the post game interview, <laughs> the uh, reporter asked me how I was feeling. And I was like, I just wanted to vomit at the end of that game because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's nerve wracking. You're calling pitches. This is the fourth and fifth time some of these kids are coming through the lineup because, you know, the game was so high scoring and you're just trying to figure out a way to get this game over with. Um, and, and so it was a blast. That whole weekend was phenomenal. I was proud of our kids. We competed offensively. We were there, you know, pitching wise. I think we were tired and that's not an excuse. It's something we've got to get better at. But, you know, when you're going to face and I think A&M's offense is great. Craig Schneider does a fantastic job with them. Um, you're going to face two teams that hit lots of home runs that have big, strong kids, SEC, you know, big 12 programs that should be better than you. You got to play your best. And our kids played phenomenal all weekend. Um, the seven to five game against Oklahoma, um, it, it was you know, every, everything you wanted in a loss, you know, you were right there. You knew you had a chance and to that very last inning, you know, we were a couple swings away from being able to do something. And, you know, I was proud of our kids. It was awesome to hear coach Gasso uh, give our kids props and our program props and, and, and yeah, you know, kind of contest the NCAA and say they didn't belong here because we didn't, but we made the most of it. And because of us trying to make the most of it, I think we garnered some national attention is that, you know, we've got a program that can compete and compete at the highest level. And, you know, we're not going to walk away from a challenge. We're going to do whatever we can to, to hopefully um, put our best effort in, in a 
lot of times our best effort's good enough and it can beat some pretty good teams. It's really amazing. And, and we still don't know why you're in Norman because you're right. Because obviously everybody is aware of the 400 mile radius rule and things like that. But like you could have bust to Oklahoma State, like you mentioned, you could have bust to Arkansas, which is where I thought you were going to go. Uh, you know, and I'm thinking that would have made. And then when I saw that, it was kind of perplexing. But uh, like I said, you gained a lot of respect nationally. A lot of people were following you. I remember I was covering the regionals. I was in, you know, Gainesville, Ken Erickson before the, re, you know, the press conference starts. He's like, does anybody know the Wichita score against Oklahoma? Sydney was asking in Tallahassee. Everybody was curious. And I know you all in the league were curious because I think you all had a chip on the shoulder. You know, Ken wasn't happy with a four seed in Gainesville. Sydney was a three seed. UCF was in Tallahassee. So I feel like the American, you know, had a bit of a chip on the shoulder based on the seedings they got. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, you look at it, all three of us made it to the finals. I mean, the American Conference is solid in softball and solid all year round. I mean, we all play competitive schedules and we had a couple teams that were a little bit down this year, which is not necessarily normal. But we had teams that were going out there every single day and competing with top 10 programs. I mean, I think Central Florida beat Florida twice that year. We had beaten Oklahoma State twice, Iowa State. Um, you know, we had, we had, we all had big wins, but it just never seemed like we got the, um, you know, the respect that we felt like we deserved. And, uh, you know, I, I know when we were all texting a little bit, Cindy, Ken and I that night, I mean, I think we all really wanted what was best for our, for our, you know, cohorts, for our, um, for our conference. We were all rooting for each other, you know, just because we're super competitive on the field doesn't mean we don't want to see everybody have success. And we knew we had three really good teams and that we were going to cause a little trouble for everybody. And, you know, we made them earn it and that's what it's about. And, you know, I'm happy for them just as I hope they're happy for us. And, you know, there's no doubt about it in my mind that as soon as we could tune into an American Conference game in that postseason, everybody in our program did it because we wanted them to have success. It makes us look better, you know, and um, I, I think that it's, you know, obviously we're losing Central Florida, but, you know, we're gaining some 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 quality softball programs moving forward. But it was a great year for our league and, and something that I think the American Conference is proud of. It was competitive. It was a dogfight. And it taught us in those four games that you had to keep going. You had to keep fighting and until the end. And I think that was very much shown in our regionals between all three teams, UCF, Central Florida, and us. We're speaking with Christy Bredbenner, Wichita State head coach here on In the Circle. So now this offseason, uh, What's been the approach like? First of all, is, do you have a different show you guys watch right now? Do you have, have you picked out a show to bond yet? But how do you approach this team? Because everybody got pat on the back for the great year, you know, and, and the successful. But now here comes another year. You've got some veterans. you got some new faces to blend in. Uh, what's been this fall like for you? Well, you got to move on for one, you know, you're totally right. Pat on the back, but it's time to, you know, kick in the butt too, where we, we've got to find the people that are going to replace some really, really key figures, you know, in the success that we had last year. Um, so we'll probably watch Ted Lasso season two at the start okay. of the season. Um, you know, there's some, there's some uh, definitely some good lessons in that one. I've watched it and the girls and I were talking the other day. I think there's only three girls of our 23 that have watched it. So, uh, which is pretty good. So the, the rest of the 20, I'll get to watch it as a team. The one thing that's great about season two with Ted Lasso is there's a lot of focus on mental health and it being okay to talk things through and, and not to continue to harbor um, maybe some anxiety or some pressures that you're dealing with in your life, that it's okay to go to a counselor. It's not a sign of weakness. And I think that that's a, a really great, um, you know, way of looking at things for young uh, student athletes, young, young, young people in general. I think there's a stigma associated a lot of times with mental health, that it is a sign of weakness. And I think we can all uh, learn from that. And, and so I'm excited for our girls to watch that. We've got a really great sports psychologist, um, Dr. Bree, whose first year with our program was with, with our athletic department was this past year. And, and she really wants to get involved in our programs. And, and we want her to be involved. We want our kids to, to utilize her. And so I'm excited about that with Ted Lasso. So we'll, we'll watch season two. Um, but the biggest takeaway from us for the fall was 
um, more than anything, figuring out who we are as a team. What are our goals going to be? Because yes, we're coming off of the most historic year in program history. Um, but at the end of the day, this, the, 50% of the reason that we had success is not in the, not in the program, not on the roster anymore. And so the big thing is, you know, figuring out who's going to step in and preparing them. And, um, you know, we're going to be young in the circle on one half, you know, we've got two fifth year seniors, Aaron McDonald and Caitlin Bingham that Aaron had a little bit of an injury last year, but this fall looked very sharp, very good. Um, Caitlin, you know, has probably the most experience by far coming back. And, you know, I think understanding that she's going to continue to evolve and differentiate and understand that teams have a lot of video on her being a fifth year senior that, you know, she's going to have to be better than she was last year to have success. And then three freshmen. Uh, we redshirted a girl last year, Jordan Pipkin, who I think has the potential to be really, really good from the Tulsa area. She uh, has good velo, good movement. She's just got to figure out how to comp compete every single day consistently. And I think that once she figures that out, she could be really good in our program. Um, and then we've got two true freshmen, Kenzie and, and Allison, who really great compliments of each other, lefty, righty, up, one's up, one's down, you know, a little bit of everything. And, and so we're going to lean on them. So we've got a five person staff that we're going to focus on being able to manipulate a little bit more. I think that that's the growing trend in, in college softball is having a staff and, you know, understanding when to make changes and, and where you're at in the game and who you can put in to keep teams off balances, balance because offenses are just so great and, and they can prepare so much for what you're going to present them. So we're going to have to really focus in on that and, and, and they're going to have to understand what their strengths are and really play to them um, to their advantage. I think offensively, you know, we lose 48 home runs uh, and that's a lot. So for us to hit 103, I would be, a I would be pumped if we hit a hundred home runs. Again. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm not saying it's not achievable. Lauren Mills is going to be in the lineup probably on an everyday basis. She hit 11 being in the lineup at about 50% pace. Um, Neely Herring's back. She's got a lot of power. Obviously, Addie Barnard's back. Sid McKinney, who was the player of the year, All-American, first time first time you've ever had an All-American is back. Um, you know, so you, you're going to build your offense around the people that return. But we've got some good kids that have come in and, and really kind of shown that they can compete. we got two pretty good transfers. Ariel James transferred in from Houston. Um, she's going to help us offensively. She's a steady Eddie kind of hitter. She's not going to be super flashy, but she finds ways to, ways to get on base. Um, great base runner, good defensive player. So she'll compete to, to start at second base and has a good chance. Zoe Jones, we picked her up from, from Texas Tech. Um, had a great freshman campaign at Tech and then struggled a little bit last year. Um, and, and so we're hoping to renew her um, energy. And, and I really like her vibe out on the field. She's kind of a, a gamer who loves to compete. And, and so she'll compete at third base for us a little bit. Um, but, you know, more than anything, it's some of our kids that are returning from the previous years that had really great role models that were just right behind somebody. Lauren Lucas has a great chance in the outfield of getting some playing time. Bailey Urban ended up being our everyday left fielder last year. She returns. And, and I think the experience that she had last year really helped her. Uh, Wiley Glover is a super senior and very determined and really wanting to, to be an everyday player for us. And so you're seeing some of that. The biggest question mark, I think, for our program is going to be behind the plate. You know, Madison Perrigan was a five-year starter, phenomenal player, phenomenal teammate, grew so much in our program, obviously contributed immense, immensely offensively. Um, but I think the area we're going to miss her the most is just her work ethic and desire to make our pitchers better. Right. And, you know, I, those are the type of things that, you know, we we have to figure out. We've got Jessica Garcia and Lainey Brown who have been in our program now for a little bit, and they've had a great, great role model to look at and be, oh, there you go, be focused on and, and emulate, and um, they have to continue to keep getting better. 
you know, they've got to develop that same camaraderie with Aaron and Caitlin that, that Butters always had, and then really take the younger kids under our wings and, and develop. And, you know, that position obviously is a position that's one of the most important to me in the game, because you control so many things, the pace, the attitude, a lot of times the, you know, you're controlling the, the pitcher and that battery piece of it. All eyes are on the catcher all the time you know, you're involved in every single pitch. And so the competition between those two is, has been pretty stiff. And, you know, we're, we, we've even considered bringing in a, a somebody at semester and, and are still considering something like that in that area as well to, to really kind of drive the competition because um, it's such a crucial position. And, um, you know, so it'll be, it'll be a, a dogfight, I think, for them and, and, and two very qualified candidates. But at the end of the day, you're going to go with the one who wants it the most and who has kind of positioned themselves in the, in, in the coach's eyes that, you know, to, to be the everyday starter. Because I think it's a tough position to switch every game. You know, you can't do a 50-50 catcher position because I just, I don't think it works. And so that's going to be the biggest thing. The off season for our catching position is a big opportunity for them to grow and be ready to go when they come back in January. How as a staff do you kind of put, because no matter who ends up at catcher, they're not going to be Madison Perrigan. I mean, that's one of the greatest players in the history, maybe arguably the greatest player in your program history with the numbers that she's accomplished uh, and, uh, you know, defensively, offensively. But yet somebody, you know, you just, is it, how important is it to tell whoever that is? And maybe this goes across the offense. That was a historic offense you had. If it wasn't for Oklahoma, I think more nationally would be paid attention to your your offense historically. I mean, you shattered a ton of school records. You were right up there nationally. You may not reach those numbers, but that doesn't mean you can't have a successful offense. So, and, and have a great offense. So how do you balance that out where the bar is so high, you may not be able to reach it, but that doesn't mean that it's a disappointment. It's a, that you could still be a success there and not compare to the, the predecessor, if you will. Well, I just, I don't think you compare, you know, I don't, you know, it's a new year. It's a new season. There's new challenges. Um, you know, it's almost like coming off of a sophomore slump, you know, or, or having like that sophomore slump that you can see teams have when you start comparing the previous year and trying to emulate it exactly or be better than it. Sometimes that's not possible. You know, there's so many factors that are associated with that. And, and so to us, it's just about getting better daily and controlling more of the mental side of the game, especially for our returners of being able to calm yourselves down and understand that now there's more film out there on you. You're not a, you're not new. You're not a surprise to anybody. They're prepared for you. So knowing that they're prepared for you, what are the things that you're not very good at admitting those types of things? And then those are the things you work on. You've got to get better at this stuff that you know you're going to see. And I think that that's been important with our program is just really having a solid foundation offensively, defensively, in the circle. Um, And that's where that battery comes to mind. Yeah, you know, are Jess and Laney Madison Perrigan? No, they're not. But they're also, you know, potentially as good as Madison Perrigan was her freshman year, you know, she just took up all the innings for five years. And now they've got to figure out, okay, if I get this opportunity, this is how I've got to grow as an athlete. And this is how I've got to get better. And, you know, I may not want to compare myself to her, but you know what, at the end of the day, I want to be um, that everyday catcher like she was. And I want to maybe put my numbers in the record books. But I think if you're going to compare anything you compare how hard Madison Perrigan worked and you work as hard as her because she was a worker. She didn't say no to anything. She came in and always wanted to hit extra, always wanted to catch bullpens. She was catching pitchers all the time. It would be nothing for her to catch two bullpens and then go to practice because, you know, she loved it. That That's how she knew she was going to make our program better is by being there for her teammates and putting in everything that she possibly could. And on top, she was in great shape. I mean, that's the biggest evolution of Madison Perrigan when you look at her is that her freshman year, she was a great softball player. Don't get me wrong. She was a little pudgy. You know, she probably wasn't, you know, as proficient in the weight room. You know, she had done some stuff with Ron or trainer and things like that. But I don't think she understood the level at which she needed to be able to compete at because she hadn't experienced it yet. 
And as soon as she had experienced that freshman year, I think it was like, okay, I want to be the best. I want to be the best version of myself. And I'm going to put everything that I can into this game that I love to be that version of myself. Those are the athletes that you want on your team. A hundred percent, you know, and if they're going to, if, if our returning catchers are going to take anything away from Madison or compare themselves to her anyway, it's through the work ethic. It's through the time. It's through the, in my opinion, the devotion to this program. And I think that that's something that a lot of our seniors that graduated this past year did. I mean, they all evolved as athletes. They were all very good at the end of their careers, better than they were at the beginning. And, and you know, it emulated what we talk a lot about it as a program. They left our program better than they found it. They also got better. You know, and that's what when we recruit and when we're going after kids, we go after athletic kids who maybe aren't blue chip top 100 recruits that are, you know, SEC bound. We go after the kid that is super athletic, that has a good arm, that has a decent swing, but maybe they're not getting the looks. And then we coach them up. And, and if in four years we can continue to make them better each season by coaching them up and, and continuing to play to their strengths, but work on their weaknesses, we're going to have a great kid in four years. And Madison Peregrine is a great example of that. She got so much better in our program, worked hard at it, and, and wanted to be the best version of herself, and she was. She was. And other examples you have, of course, Sydney McKinney. Hit 439 last year, 87 hits, as you mentioned earlier, first ever All-American program history. And then Addison, who you told me about when we spoke last year, he's like, watch out for this kid. This kid's got power. You weren't kidding. 323 average, 22 home runs, 61 RBIs, 768 slugging. You told me she was a freshman. She didn't play like a freshman. No, nah, she didn't. She had a breakout year, you know, breakout year. And I think... For her to, to have that same success, it's mental this year for her. Everything's the same. She's got the same swing. She's still strong as an ox. She's got all those same qualities. But now she's got to figure it out mentally because nobody, you know, like I said, nobody's surprised by her anymore. They're going to know her weaknesses. And so she can't create more weaknesses in herself by putting too much pressure on herself to have that 22 home run season. She just got to allow it to happen and trust her abilities. And, and so that'll be her biggest challenge this year. Same thing for Sid. Sid had a wonderful year last year, one of the best ever in our program. And, uh, you know, she can't she can't carry all the weight on her shoulders. She's going to have to just do what she does, which sometimes is just getting on on a blue pit. And sometimes it's hitting a home run. And and there's you know, there's nothing in the in the scorebook that changes that blue pit from a blue pit not counting as a hit. It's a hit in the book. And, you know, she did a great job of those types of things last year. And she's just going to have to continue to keep working through, um, you know, maybe not having as much protection in the lineup as she's had in these last couple of years. Same with Addie. You know, when you have Addie, Addie, it's Sid, Addie, and Madison Perrigan batting one, two, three. I can't name a better one, two, three combination in the time that we've been in the American Conference. And then you also had Riley Buck later in the lineup, <laughs> who, by the way, yeah. shout out to her. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was, you know, that lineup last year was very special. They protected each other. They found ways to get on. And when one person had a bad game, somebody else or multiple people picked them up. And that was why we had success. And, and as a coach, that's every coach's dream. You try to have that and figure that out every year. Who are the leaders on this team? Is it is it Sid? Is it the veterans? I mean, does that evolve? I mean, where is the leadership right now on this team? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's it's been pretty good. You know, I still think they're trying to find their way a little bit. And some of our youngsters are chill, still trying to find their, um, you know, who they are and, and what their purpose is. Um, we've got a couple. I mean, we talk a lot about physical leaders, leaders by example versus leaders that are vocal. And I think Sid, Wiley Glover have kind of taken over a little bit more of that leadership quality of the vocal side of it. It's been cool to see Neely Herring's evolved more as a vocal leader. She's been quiet as a mouse and that silent leader who always has worked hard and, and competes and has gotten better every year. Um, so to me, she's that leader by example more than she's a vocal leader, but she's really trying to step into that role. Um, you know, a kid on our in our program that doesn't get any credit, any zero, because she doesn't get in the lineup very often, who to me is one of our best leaders is Madison Espinosa. I mean, um, you know, little small fire fire plug. I mean, just 
the best. And, you know, when you talk about the type of teammates that you're looking for in a program that, that has success, you have to have several Madison Espinosas. I wish I could have more um, because she provides the energy, the swag, the comedic relief that you need every now and then. Um, she works hard every single day and she's the most unselfish person I've ever met she celebrates her teammates successes so much that, you know, sometimes you, you, she's hoarse by the end of, of a game or practice or things like that. And you got to have somebody like that. that's on your bench that gets everybody on the bench fired up and focused on the thing that they can control, which is helping the team at the time in the best way they can. And, and she does such a good job of it. So we've got some great leaders moving forward and, you know, I think it's just continuing to find our identity and, and seeing where we're at. You know, we we played eight games this fall, six against Division Two NAIA JUCO type teams. And, you know, we did a really good job. We scored a lot of runs. We didn't give up very many runs. It, they weren't as competitive games as I would have liked, um, but we did play Kansas and we played Oklahoma State and we, we, we had a good game against Kansas. And, you know, to be honest with you, I was a little nervous going to Stillwater when we went down there because I mean they reload every year they're just they pitch it so well they they do so many things right they went to the world series you know they graduated a few but then I mean brought in some really good kids and and obviously have two really good kids coming in at semester for them but they were going to be our biggest um evaluating type opportunity for us from the fall and we lost four to three in 10 innings they gave they hit a grand slam we hit a three run home run so from an offensive perspective not a ton of offense but I was really really pleased with our pitchers you know one of the biggest things we did over the summer was we stuck with Presley Bell I think our kids really relate well with her she's very young um, young and upcoming dynamic pitching coach who keeps it simple and, and really has a strong foundation of fundamentals. And I think she's doing a nice job with our pitching staff. She called a great game against Oklahoma State. And um, even Jeff Cottrell, their their coach, after the game was like, whoa, you guys played much better than I assumed you were going to play. And that's a great compliment. I think that that's something that you hope your kids get excited about because, um, you know, they're going to be a good program this year. And it kind of gave us a little bit of a hint that we could be really good this year, but we've got to play well. We've got to pitch well. We've got to, you know, we've got to continue to keep getting better every day and and hope for the best once the season starts. You mentioned Presley, but was that what did she, was she planning on being a coach that this just kind of happened? Cause I know, you know, you kind of had, had to help, you know, she helped you on the staff last year and that obviously did a heck of a job to the point where now she's a full-time assistant. Was that part of the plan? And then, also, by the way, uh, director of ops. Now you've got Nicole Penley. That uh, I, I like your chances as far as director of ops who could play. Yeah, well, those those two hires were out of the park home runs for us. I mean, you know, Presley wants to coach. That was her goal, and um, we're fortunate enough we get a graduate manager position every every year. And and I'm big on getting a graduate manager that wants to be a coach. I I don't want somebody that we're just going to take on to throw BP for us for two years and they're going to get their, you know, master's in education and go teach at the high school level and never coach again. I want somebody that wants to coach softball, especially at the collegiate level, because if they're invested and, and it's something they want to do for a profession, then there's a lot of learning opportunities for that graduate manager in our program, because we're going to try to get them involved in everything that we possibly can within our limitations. And, and that's what we did with Presley. You know, she comes in, she works in the office for us. We did some stuff with her with recruits. We, you know, you just kind of teach them, Hey, this is what coaching is. It's not, um, Hey, come and throw BP, come and set up our practices, do this and that. I mean, don't get me wrong. She throws a mean batting practice, which is awesome for our program, but we also put her in the bullpen. We put her in the cages. We're putting her on the field defensively to learn what we're teaching so that she's developing a, a coaching philosophy and getting the most out of her two years. And I think for us, after, you know, putting her into the situation we did last year with her being the bullpen person, you know, she put together all of our bullpens and, and you know, helped the pitchers and, you know, provided feedback to us. Um, as the staff and and she proved that she could be that pitching coach you know and she's still learning and growing and understanding everything that it takes to be a coach but she wants it and she wants to do really well and I think she's realized that she really has a passion for 
pitch co- being a pitching coach and, and, and wants to continue to grow in that profession. So that was a no brainer, great decision and, and an easy one. And, you know, Nicole Penley has been uh, the best director of ops we've had, you know, and we've had some good ones. I mean, in, in former players that have been director of ops, Casey Williams and, and Lorianne Derrico, who they knew what we were used to doing. And so for me, that was huge. You know, they, they knew how I like things. Nicole is a little different because she's bringing a lot of different ideas because she's coming from different programs. She spent last the last two years at Mississippi State with Sam Ricketts. Um, as their graduate manager, and then obviously played at Oklahoma and how Coach Gasso does things. And, you know, they've had a great director of operations, Jackie Livingston, there for a while now. I can't even remember who was the director of ops before her. She's been there for so long. And and so she's doing more than I ever expected a director of ops can do on her own. Bringing things to our program is selfless, takes care of things. I mean, she makes my life a heck of a lot easier in the number of things that she does, but her perspective on her experiences and, you know, good and bad has been fantastic for our program. And I think it's, um, you know, it's been a pretty valuable asset for us this year. So we're fired up about our staff, Um, you know, Coach Economan, our hitting coach, she's associate head coach, was named that over the summer you know, she's the best. We, we went to college together. I, I, you know, we, I trust her, you know, with my children and, you know, I would trust her with this program. If, if anything ever happened and I had to walk away or be gone, I mean, she does a, such a good job. And then you add Presley and, and Nicole and you look at it and it's like, oh, four females or well, four females that are very driven, have passion for the game, but also really care about the people that they surround themselves with. And I think that's always going to be a good formula for success. Nicole, you mentioned came over with Samantha Ricketts, who was once once upon a time on your staff too, part of your coaching yep. tree there. Yep, yep. So, you know, it, the, the circle of coaches in life is <laughs> it's funny how it can repeat. Last uh, thing, uh, the American Conference, obviously, it's been an interesting offseason in college athletics in general, uh, and the Americans are part of that. You mentioned earlier, UCF and Houston eventually will move on to the Big 12 down the road. The American, though, is going to add Charlotte. Ashley Chastain's done a good job building that program up. North Texas with Roddy DeLong there. FAU and legendary head coach Joan Joyce will be a part of the program. UTSA and UAB, a team that was kind of the mix. Kind of your thoughts as... You see all this unfold. It's not going to affect you for a, a few years uh, down the road, but still, what's been your reaction to all this movement? Well, you know, I think it's going to be a tough, tough to see Central Florida and Houston go. Um, you know, more than anything, they're great programs, great softball programs, great people, great coaches. Um, you know, just I've enjoyed playing against them and and just really the, the competition side of things, um, you know, from an RPI perspective, they hurt a little bit, you know, but I think the cool thing for us, you know, the programs that we're adding, those programs are on the uptick. They've invested in their softball programs, you know, and, and they're continuing to invest in their softball programs. Charlotte's investing in their athletic department. Um, North Texas is investing in their athletic department. And you're seeing, you know, the, 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 they're reaping the benefits because you're seeing how much stronger their programs are getting. And I'm not just talking softball. I'm talking about in a lot of other sports. But softball specifically, I mean, over the last couple of years, Charlotte, you know, Ashley's done a, a great job. And, and Rodney, you know, has evolved in that North, North Texas program and done a really nice job. And you know, so I'm excited because I think it definitely brings in um, some good softball programs. I'm excited because it makes our conference bigger. Um, you know, we're going to go to a, a conference of 10 instead of seven. And that's more home games for us in Wichita because next year we only have 11 home games. It's tough a lot of times to get teams to come and play here because we're surrounded by so many power five you know, programs that can offer guarantees and different things like that. And, and, and so I think just having the the extra home games and will be good. The travel is going to be a little bit more difficult. You know, we're adding quite a few teams that we're going to have to fly to now, um, you know, in a couple, a little bit longer bus trips, but the trip to North Texas, easy, easy peasy for us. It's a five hour trip right down the road. And, you know, obviously that'll help us tremendously, but you know, good people, good programs. And, and, you know, as we add people to our, um, you know, conference, 
our university, Wichita State, we got to continue to keep up with the Joneses and, and, you know, be able to compete. And, you know, that's been one really benefit that we've seen from the success that we had this past year is that, you know, we've really had to look at our program and decide how do we continue to keep getting better? And how do we continue to sustain some of this level of success? Or did we just, you know, um, have that one great year and, you know, we're not going to have it again. We don't want to do that, but we've got a lot of things that we've got to continue as an athletic department to invest in our athletics. And, you know, we're seeing a little bit of that with softball. We're unable to host the conference tournament in the American because we don't meet a couple of the metrics uh, when you look at the evaluation. And, and that was a big deal to me because I think, you know, we should get to host. We should have a competitive enough field when we're winning the league. The number one team in the conference should get to host the conference tournament. And our athletic department and university has acknowledged that and they're investing the money that they can to hopefully allow us to host here in the future, which means new lights, a new visitor's dugout, which actually might end up being our dugout with some of the things that we're moving to, and then a hitting area. And, and you know, we're getting land donated by the university, which is awesome, and allowing ourselves to expand a little bit. But, you know, those are the things that when you talk about the Madison Paragons, the Riley Bucks, the Bailey Langs, they never got that stuff. But we're getting it because of them. And, you know, they're, they're the reason that, you know, they're leaving the program better than they found it because our new kids that are coming in are going to get to benefit from things they didn't have. And that's important when we're moving into this new conference is to can you continue to keep evolving as a program, recognizing some of our weaknesses and some of our areas of improving and, and doing whatever we can to, to try to combat them and, and, and make them strengths for us. Well, that's exciting news. I didn't know about that. So congrats on that. I'm happy to hear that about the Thank facilities. You. I think that's a great thing. It's part of the growth of the sport across the landscape. So I'm glad you're being rewarded there. Uh, and certainly the future looks bright. Last quick question now for this year, though. This, the, that's down the road. This year, what's going to be the keys for your team? You're going to have a target on your back, especially when you get to conference, defending the title. What's going to be the keys for this team to accomplish it, your internal goals? Well, we're going to have to play together as a team. I mean, we've got talent. We've got we've got the ability to do it, but we're going to have to, you know, have the leadership and, and the understanding that with the pressure, with the target on our back, we can still go out every single day. We've got to play our best. And, uh, you know, I think that the little bit of a chip on our shoulder last year of having such a poor 2020 COVID year kind of gave us the, oh, we were a little bit of the underdog. We weren't picked, I think, fifth in the league and finished first. We've got a better chance of being picked a little bit more. I don't think we'll get picked first in the league because of the number of kids we lost. But I think that should be a, a, a driver of momentum for our team is that, you know what? We, yeah, might have lost five or six kids that played every day. But the bottom line is, is we're replacing them with kids that can compete as well. And our, our returners have to step up. Our young kids have to step up. And, you know, the bottom line is, is that it's a long season and we've got a plethora of away games. We go six weekends on the road before we play at home to get ourselves figured out. We're going to be road warriors. And we, you know, our motto this year is pound the stone, keep working every single day to, to try to turn something that's not very pretty into something that's pretty at the end. And, um, you know, sometimes that takes time. So we'll see how long it takes for our team to get to that point. Well, we can't wait to see your team on the field once it gets going here in the 2022 the start of the season. But, uh, in the meantime, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, congrats on the success to this point. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you this year. And uh, good luck. And uh, we'll certainly cross paths, I'm sure, uh, moving forward. But in the meantime, uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, as always, we always appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, Eric. And happy holidays. Hope you have a nice Christmas. And, you know, I'm sure we'll definitely see you soon.